Good morning. I'm Gregory Allen, the director of the Wadwani Center for AI and Advanced Technologies here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Matt Turek, the deputy director of the Information Innovation Directorate at DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA is a legendary organization in the history of so many technologies, not least of which are AI and autonomy. And that's the focus of our conversation today. Dr. Matt Turek, thank you so much for coming to CSIS. Thanks, really looking forward to the conversation. Before we get into the meat of what DARPA is up to in AI and autonomy, I wanted to get a little bit about your own background mm -hmm. and sort of how you got into the field of AI and how you got into the field of military uh, AI and autonomy. Mm -hmm. So how did, you, how did you come to this work in this field? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I, I started my career, I, I was lucky actually at, uh, at GE Medical Systems as part of the Edison Engineering Program. So entry level rotational engineering uh, program and uh, really started with a great uh, cohort of, uh, of people on that program. Uh, that got me broad experience across GE Medical Systems. This was the mid 90s um, and so you know that was times when there was early interest in um, you know, having automated algorithms as second readers on medical image analysis. Um, and GE is very well known for all kinds of medical scanners like mm -hmm. CAT scans, MRIs. They're, they're big in that kind of sensor technology. Right, yeah, yeah. Th uh, and that was the business at the time. And of course, GE has uh, morphed quite a bit uh, since then. And um, I, I spent some time at GE Medical Systems, uh, and then I had a, a really excellent opportunity to move to the GE Global Research Center and uh, work in a research environment that uh, both serves industry but also interacted with, uh, with government. Um, and then from there I left actually and uh, went and got a PhD. So that gave me the academic background, um, provided some of that academic rigor. Um, and uh, you know, obviously that has been really useful. And then after that I joined a small business and was there for about uh, 10 years or so and helped run a computer vision team. And that's really the time in which I started working more on uh, AI, particularly computer vision, in military relevant domains. And a lot of that was funding from agencies like DARPA, but also working with Air Force Research Labs and, and NGA and others. Um, and what ultimately became really attractive for me was just knowing that I was serving this broader mission uh, and sort of feeling that uh, tangibly. And, and you know, that's something that has made my time at DARPA uh, after I left that uh, small business in 2018. Um, you know, that has really been sort of the fuel for uh, passion of, uh, of the work at DARPA is that ability to, um, be in, to do work in service to the warfighter. And so you've been a part of the computer vision AI revolution, both in the handcrafted algorithms mm -hmm. era, all the way to the sort of modern machine learning and neural networks uh, part of the story, and been serving your country during that uh, mm -hmm. transformation, which is really exciting. So uh, DARPA is, of course, well known all around the world mm -hmm. as a legendary technology organization. But there's so much about what's going on in AI and autonomy that DARPA has been central to, both in the past mm -hmm. uh, and in the present. So. How do you sort of sum up what DARPA is up to in the AI and autonomy field today? Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. I mean, I guess I'll just start as a, with a reminder that like DARPA started in 1958. We've been investing in AI probably since the early 60s. Uh, you know, so going back to just a few years after the the uh, coining of the term AI. Um, I2O specifically, the Information Innovation Office uh, within DARPA has really four key thrust areas. So proficient artificial intelligence is one of them, confidence in the information domain. So that might be tools that help us understand things like manipulated media, um, building secure and resilient systems, and then uh, tools in, uh, in uh, cyber, um, both uh, defensive and offensive. Um, and there's a lot of synergies across those uh, thrust areas. So, you know, we have efforts that are blending both, you know, uh, advancing AI and advancing the state of capability in cyber. Uh, there's interactions between AI, um, again, sort of core AI algorithms and the development of tools that might help us understand things like uh, manipulated media. Um, that's within I2O. There's five other technical offices, and I think it's, it's worth saying that you know, AI and autonomy is really being used broadly across the agency now. Probably something like 70% of our programs have some type of AI, machine learning, uh, autonomy associated with it. So there is really broad uh, penetration across the agency. So it's really difficult to, to sum up 
uh, you know, what the agency as a whole is up to. Um, but uh, from an I2O perspective, we're really looking to try and advance, you know, how do we get to highly trustworthy AI, AI that we can bet our lives on and, and that not be a foolish thing to do. Uh, that's an incredible line, by the way, AI that we could bet our lives on and that not be a foolish thing to do. I'll have to remember that one. Um, I want to ask a little bit about how DARPA works, mm -hmm. uh, because on the DARPA resume is incredible things like stealth technology, mm -hmm. like the invention of the internet. But DARPA has an incredibly diverse project portfolio, and it also has an incredibly diverse project management toolkit. So could you just explain what are the sort of different types of DARPA projects, how they accomplish their goals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, DARPA's core mission when we were founded was uh, to prevent strategic surprise, and we also think about creating strategic surprise. Again, the founding of the agency was tied to Sputnik, was something that created Which is one heck of a surprise. Created yeah. uh, strategic surprise uh, for the U.S. It wasn't necessarily a surprise that they uh, uh, were launching a satellite. Um, the details that were actually what was surprising, like what was the size of the payload, and the implication of that, the size of the payload meant well they perhaps could put a nuclear weapon in orbit on an ICBM. And, uh, if they could do this, then they can do that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that for sure created a strategic surprise. And again, that uh, just a handful of months later led to the creation of DARPA with like a page and a half memo. So just think about, you know, standing up a multi-billion dollar agency now with a, uh, with a page and a half uh, memo. But, um, you know, back to your question about, you know, how do we think about investments and the project portfolio and, and, and how do we uh, manage them? So, um, you know, DARPA in service to that um, preventing or creating strategic surprise really looks to be disruptive. You know, can we disrupt adversary capabilities by coming up with a new defensive capability? Can we uh, provide a new strategic capability for the U.S. that disrupts what adversaries are able to do? And you mentioned things like stealth and GPS, and those are some of the classical examples. Um, so how do we get to that level of, uh, of disruption? Um, you know, one of the things that really starts with actually is just hiring great program managers. And we always need to hire uh, program managers. Um, everyone is on a clock at DARPA, so that forces turnover. Um, and so, you know, uh, ideas are very bottom up uh, driven within uh, DARPA. Um, and then, again, with that lens towards disruption, it might be. Do we just need to make an investment to help instantiate a research community in a particular space that's necessary to the DOD? Do we need to uh, build a transformative capability for a warfighter and get it in their hands as quickly as possible? Those are sort of two different poles on a continuum of, of technology, and we really look at those uh, particular endpoints now uh, to help shape how we think about uh, you know, about the investment process. And so in the, in the former case where you're trying to create a research community, mm -hmm. this might just be something like, we think this is an interesting area and we wish people were exploring it, mm -hmm. so we're gonna start making grants for people who wanna mm -hmm. do that, which is you know, vaguely analogous to the way that the National Science Foundation mm -hmm. might do its work. Mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, as you said, DARPA can actually conceptualize an idea, run it all the way to not just the development of the prototype, mm -hmm. but maybe even a version that, that warfighters get access to. Yeah. So there's a really diverse Diverse, uh, set of project yeah, types. And, and on that, you know, the comment about the instantiating the research community, you know, it's unlikely that we're going to say, well, you know, we're going to behave like NSF and we're just going to sort of uh, seed some money. We're going to approach it with a particular purpose, mm. you know, tracing back to a perceived gap in our technical capabilities or a perceived gap in our understanding of technical capabilities. We really feel like more research in this area is needed. And so we can help create that research by forming a program with particular problems and, and then uh, uh, funding researchers uh, to carry that out. Um, that might be done, again, with the plan that, hey, we need to help create a research uh, community in a, in a particular space or maybe help balance uh, research communities. Again, you know, this traces back to the fact that, that DOD needs and industry needs or you know, academia needs uh, may be different. So if we make those sorts of investments, they will be very intentional uh, in order to, again, help uh, create a technology base uh, that can be transformational for the warfighter. And then, yes, that other endpoint, you know, there, uh, maybe there is a near-term pressing uh, need uh, that no one else can meet, or we have a transformative idea that uh, 
you know, would be highly beneficial if we could rapidly get that in the hands of the, of the warfighter. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that, that helps. Those two end uh, points on that spectrum really help inform our thinking about investments. So in just a moment, uh, we're going to talk about examples of programs mm -hmm. that DARPA is currently running in AI and autonomy in both of those types of categories. But before mm -hmm. we do that, I wanted to ask sort of how DARPA fits into the DOD picture. Mm -hmm. Because while DARPA you know, has a long storied history in AI, as you mentioned, there's other organizations that have been created around technology adoption, technology innovation, such as uh, the Defense Innovation Unit, DIU, uh, which is now a direct report to the Secretary of Defense. Mm -hmm. There's also the Office of the Chief Digital and AI Officer, the CDAO organization, mm -hmm. which reports to the DEPSEC DEF. And so I'm curious, you know, sort of how does DARPA fit in fit into the, the DOD portfolio mm -hmm. of organizations working on AI? And I guess the other part that we didn't mention is the service labs right. and the service programs of record. So where does DARPA fit into this story? Yeah. And those are, uh, that's a great question. And those are all partners that, that uh, we work with uh, throughout sort of the, the spectrum of uh, technology. I guess I should, I should acknowledge here that the CDAO's predecessor organization, the Joint AI Center where I worked, was actually a customer of your work specifically mm -hmm. uh, related to the, to the metaphor program yep. on, on deep fake detection. Yeah, that, that, yeah I mean, that was, uh, that's one example of uh, the sort of collaboration and it's actually deepened uh, with CDAO across, uh, in particular, across multiple programs. But um, let me start by giving that uh, sort of giving that broad perspective, and then maybe I can give you a couple examples of uh, places where there's uh, where there's collaboration. Um, so again, uh, DARPA's core mission: prevent, and create strategic surprise. So the implication there is that we're looking over the horizon uh, for uh, transformative capabilities. So in some sense, we are very early in the research uh, pipeline, uh, typically. Um, products that come out of those research programs could go a couple places. They can uh, stay within the DOD and then uh, transitioning them to CDAO, for instance, might enable a uh, broad transition across the entirety of the, the DOD. Um, you know, I'm actually happy that uh, the Jake was stood up, uh, that CDAO is there, because I think having a organization that can provide some shared resources and capabilities across the department it can be a, a resource where place people can go look for help or tools or capabilities. I think that's really useful. And from a DARPA perspective, it gives us a natural uh, transition partner. So yes, on our media forensics program, we uh, transitioned algorithms over to the Joint AI Center for assessment and uh, to uh, just demonstrate across the force. We continue to do that with other programs like our Guaranteeing AI Robustness Against uh, Deception program. So that is a program that's focused on building defenses against uh, adversarial attacks on AI systems. So whether that is physically realizable attacks or noise patterns that are added to AI systems, uh, the GUARD program has built state-of-the-art defenses against those. Some of those uh, tools and capabilities have been provided to CDAO. Can you just talk a, yeah. a minute a bit? Because I think a lot of our audience will have heard of adversarial AI, but mm -hmm. perhaps not all. So what is the okay. sort of problem you're, you're trying to solve here in the GUARD program specifically? Yeah. So um, one of the things uh, that's, well, I guess uh, two, two starting points for AI systems. So AI systems are made out of uh, software, obviously, right? So they inherit all the, the cyber vulnerabilities, and those are an important class of vulnerabilities, but not what I'm talking about here. There are sort of unique classes of vulnerabilities for AI or autonomous systems uh, where you can do things like um, insert noise patterns into sensor data that might cause an AI system to misclassify. Um, so you can essentially, by adding noise to an image or a sensor, perhaps break a downstream machine learning algorithm. You can also, with knowledge of that algorithm, sometimes create physically realizable attacks. So you could uh, generate uh, very purposefully a particular sticker that you could put on a physical object that when the data is collected, when that uh, object shows up in an image, that that particular what's called adversarial patch um, makes it so that the machine learning algorithm might not recognize that object exists or might misclassify that tank as a school bus. Um, so those are sort of classical examples. Uh, you know, there's other classical examples of 
put, placing a sticker on a stop sign and, and causing a machine learning system to misclassify that as a speed limit sign. Yeah, so uh, what, what, you're, what you're getting at here is that every AI system is sort of a combination of traditional software and machine learning software. Mm -hmm. And you can hack those systems either by hacking the traditional software, but what you're getting at is there's this entire new category right. of hacks, which is often, often called adversarial AI, and you're trying to think about how do DOD systems have safeguards embedded so that they're not vulnerable to this sort of category of attacks. Yeah, exactly. And, and not only are we thinking about it, we have created new algorithms. Some of those actually are in partnership both with the research teams that we're funding, but uh, with researchers at Google, and then created open source tools that we can provide back to the broader community so that we can uh, really uh, raise defenses broadly in AI and machine learning. Uh, but those tools also provided to CDAO, and then they can be customized for uh, DoD use cases and needs. Um, and so there's you know a multi-pronged uh, transition strategy. So, anyways, that's a a concrete example of you know how we might work with CDAO um, on the uh, defense innovation unit side. You know some of the foundational research investments from DARPA might get commercialized. They might become commercial industries, and that provides an opportunity for uh, folks like DIU to, that might take the best of breed of what's available commercially and bring that rapidly into the, uh, back into the uh, department. Right, because and, DIU sort of sees themselves as the front door to mm -hmm. DOD for the sort of commercial technology right. sector, but that commercial technology sector might have been harvesting investments that DARPA made a while ago. Yeah, and, and it actually turns out that sometimes the most efficient way to get the technology into the DOD and broadly dispersed is to go through that commercial mm. route. Um, and that avoids some of the uh, traditional you know, operations and maintenance and sustainment funding issues where you actually have a commercial entity who uh, has a business model that includes supporting the DOD, but that also might uh, include supporting you know, the broader technology base uh, within the U.S. And, and particularly in the spaces that I2O works in, you know, information domain, AI, cyber, you know, it's not just U.S. government systems that need to be protected. It's, you know, uh, the technology base, critical infrastructure, broadly speaking across the U.S. Um, those are also attack surfaces for an adversary. Great. And so before we go into sort of uh, program by program, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is going to be fascinating, I do want to get your sense of AI writ large. Sort of what mm -hmm. is this, this moment that we're currently in? Because the machine learning revolution in its sort of modern form, which really took off in, in 2012, mm -hmm. has been underway for more than a decade. And now it seems like we have this additional revolution. And, and some folks are talking about human level AI across a broad range of categories. Uh, in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. You've been in this field, deep in the weeds, deep in the research mm -hmm. community, and now a leader you know, in the research community. Where do you see the sort of current moment where we are in AI and autonomy? Yeah, yeah that's a good framing in terms of uh, you know, really the explosion that happened around 2012 or so, and, and just to put a point on it, you know, that was really the use of, uh, of AlexNet and a deep learning approach on, uh, on a computer vision uh, benchmark that um, really caught the research community's attention. Like there was just a, a significant step change in uh, performance. And what you saw in the research community uh, in terms of uh, both academia and industry as evidenced at conferences like uh, CVPR, which is Computer Vision Pattern Recognition, one of the top AI conferences in the world, um, was just this massive shift over a relatively short time where everybody was leaning into to using these uh, these sorts of deep learning approaches and then uh, you know so that's 2012 about 2014 or so Ian Goodfellow comes uh, and others come up with generative adversarial networks and and for me that's you know that's a similar sort of explosion point in what we now call generative AI yeah. right and so these generative adversarial networks was really uh, a, a really interesting insight between instead of trying to train to a particular objective function, I'm going to compete a deep neural network that can generate uh, a piece of data with another deep neural network that is going to try and detect whether that piece of media was synthetically generated or whether it's real or not. Um, and, the, um, and that really, I think, helped uh, sort of further the explosion of, of deep learning. Um, and then we started to see folks using, uh, you know, moving from computer vision into natural language processing 
and uh, using things like transformer models to do uh, token uh, predictions. So like what is the next word or what is the next fraction of word? Can I predict that? And that is uh, that really basic sounding capability is what really underlies things like ChatGPT and the, the state of the art in, in large language models. Um, and so that is what has everybody's attention uh, these days. And um, you know, what is explicit for some, but maybe implicit for, for folks that are not embedded in the community is uh, this notion of a scaling hypothesis. And so that is really a, uh, a hypothesis uh, that um, if we make larger and larger models with more and more parameters and we feed them with more and more data, that is going to get us to more and more intelligent systems. And the data, there are actual scaling laws that have been experimentally derived. So you can see that there are actually trend lines and those um, scaling laws are all based on what is my accuracy in predicting the next, uh, the next token. And the contention is that in order to do that prediction better and better, I have to actually build a underlying model of the world, uh, and that will get us uh, to intelligent systems. Um, for me, I still feel like that's a hypothesis. Mm. You know, I don't know what the ceiling is on that uh, on that uh, capability, and and so one of the things I've uh, I've said before, and I'll say here, is like this is the time of my career where I actually have the most uncertainty about what is the right technical approach, mm. what is the right technical thing to do, um, and I feel like having some technical humility is a really uh, useful approach. Uh, you know, folks from the AI community might think about that as having a more probabilistic model. If you make a hard decision, then then things can uh, can break down. So carrying that uncertainty through your your thought process, but, I think, is so. I think this is this is super interesting. So the the scaling hypothesis, I'm I'm oversimplifying here, mm -hmm. right? But it basically says if you take the existing set of algorithms, the sort of same algorithms that are already powering yeah. uh, ChatGPT and its its equivalents elsewhere in commercial industry, and you simply feed them more data for training and more computational power mm -hmm. for uh, you know running those that training approach then the performance of the system will get better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is that true or is this going to plateau at some point sort of right. short of human intelligence? And this is a debate yeah. among AI researchers around the world and I think it's quite interesting that you do not see enough evidence mm -hmm. to discount this hypothesis mm -hmm. at this current moment, right? It could be wrong, but it also could be right. Yeah. Um, and we should operate with that understanding that, that it may be the case. And then the other flip side of that is, Algorithms have made a lot of progress over the past 10 years, and that doesn't show any signs of plateauing anytime mm -hmm. soon. And so we are currently in a world where AI is really impressive, but correct me if I'm wrong here, you're not seeing anything to discount the possibility that we could be dealing with systems that are not just two times better than the current state of the art, but 10 times better, 100 times better, 1,000 times better, you know, in a matter of years or decades. Is that is that fair? Um, well, I... You know, um, again, I think uh, having the uncertainty is important here. Mm -hmm. uh, so do I know what the ceiling is for the current approaches? No, I do not. Um, do I think that uh, just, do I think that we will, um, that these approaches guarantee that we will build that underlying model sufficiently to get to something like human level intelligence, broadly speaking? Um, I'm skeptical about mm. that. Um, so you, you, your, your, your sort of hunch, I guess is the way to say it, is that we do need architectural improvements. We do need algorithmic improvements. Yeah. No, I, I think that's going to be critical. And, and I think particularly coming back to DOD needs, um, you know, how, how are DOD needs different than industry, right? Well, um, some of it revolves around our access uh, to data and compute, actually. So you might think, well, like, you know, DOD should have massive amounts of data. Well, state of the art AI systems are essentially being trained on all the data on the internet. So if you look at you know US government data holdings uh, in satellite imagery, for instance, you know that, mostly not on the internet. <laughs> it, well, also mostly not on the internet, but you know all the information that humanity has produced and is on the internet is a pretty high bar um, for being able to train state of the art AI systems. So in some sense, actually. You know, data is a challenge on the, the U.S. government side. Uh, 
I think also the criticality of the decisions and the sorts of scenarios in which we might um, want to ultimately use AI and autonomous systems are different from industry. So, you know, uh, industry revolves around um, trying to find quick uh, business opportunities. What is my business case? How do I service a, a broad customer base? How do I get that customer base as, as quickly as possible? Um, and, you know, those are all um, valid needs to address. And in fact, from a national security standpoint, like we want to have a robust commercial technical base. But that's very different from the DOD where we might not be able to pick and choose as much where we use uh, AI capabilities. We may be pressed by adversaries and that might mm. shape um, or, you know, the, uh, you know, so that's one thing that's different. Also just the criticality of decision making, right? Like there are places where, yes, summarization tools, things like LLMs could certainly help automate uh, processes. Uh, you know, particularly automate uh, bureaucratic government processes, but that's a far cry from making a life or death decision um, or even a life or death recommendation that a human then needs to resolve and say, yes, am I gonna, am I gonna go forward with, uh, with that decision point? Um, you know, I don't think industry is there um, for many cases. And, you know, again, from a business perspective, like that's not the right, the, uh, that's not the right place to start. So I think that is uh, another fundamental difference between how industry is approaching AI and how the DOD needs to think about it. So I think that's a great transition into what's going on because you're, you're obviously a very insightful observer of the field of AI and autonomy, but you're not really an observer, you're an actor in mm -hmm. this space. You're trying to shape you know, mm -hmm. the trajectory of research and I2O has a pretty impressive portfolio across this. Mm -hmm. um, I want to start with the, the program that you and I have a little bit of personal history sure. around, which is related to uh, what's commonly known as deep fakes mm -hmm. and the detecting of synthetic media. Um, and you have two programs here that have uh, done some really interesting work. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about Metaphor and Semaphore? Sure. Yeah, so Metaphor is the media forensics uh, program that was started by a previous program manager, uh, Dave Dorman. And I think we really uh, actually, the, the for the media forensics community owes him a debt of gratitude for sort of foreseeing that this problem uh, uh, was going to exist. Um, so he started building the program in 2015. It kicked off in, in 2016. Uh, ran for a board. So only one year after the Ian Goodfellow Gans yeah. insight, he was already on yeah. the. That's a fabulous. Well, and, and some of, some of the motivation was actually tied to just the capabilities in Photoshop. Right. So oh, sure, it's sure, not sure. just around generative AI. Which North Korea has historically actually used Photoshop to, to put out fake imagery. So right. of course we needed that. Right. Um, and, and so that program really focused on uh, images and video and simply, uh, you know, could we produce algorithms that would have a quantitative measure of, in, that would create a quantitative measure of integrity for a media asset. So just demonstrating that you could actually quantify the problem and that quantitative measure itself means that you could automate processes like prioritization, uh, at scale, or filtering. And so that program ran from uh, 2016 to 2020. I inherited it in the summer of uh, 2018. Um, and uh, you know that was a, a great entry point for me at DARPA. Um, and then the follow-on to that was our semantic forensics program, which I designed and uh, started. Uh, and that program kicked off in, in 2020. Uh, I handed it over to another program manager, Will Corvey, uh, when I took on the office leadership uh, role in, in 2022. Uh, but that program is focused not just on detection, uh, but also attribution. So does media come from where it claims it came from? Characterization, mm. was media generated or manipulated uh, for malicious purposes? It's super difficult to define. That's probably the hardest uh, problem on that program. You know, there has been some progress in terms of trying to uh, develop a taxonomy of how you might think about uh, malicious uh, uses of the, uh, of the technology. Uh, Semaphore is uh, winding down later this year. And so one of, uh, you know, I mentioned the commercialization path in the context of DIU. One of the things that Semaphore is doing is open sourcing some of the algorithms as proof of principle, as uh, you could think about them as reference implementations that a, a broader commercial community could use to help uh, bootstrap commercial capabilities. Um, because you know, it's not just US government that needs to have these capabilities. The attack surface is broad. And ultimately, 
you know, it can't be U.S. government that is the sole funder of research and defenses in this space. We really need to uh, create a commercial community. So we've put some open source uh, capabilities out there to help incentivize uh, that commercial development around the, the metaphor and semaphore work. And just thinking about the national security logic underpinning a program mm -hmm. like this, you know, the United States is a democracy and the quality of democratic debate really depends upon standards of truth. Mm -hmm. And we have been living in this lovely island of history where the tools for recording media mm -hmm and authenticating media have been superior to the tools for forging mm -hmm. media. And that's been true basically since the invention of the camera in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. But now we're entering this new era, and we've already sort of been in it for a bit now, mm -hmm. where the synthetic media generation tools are really catching up mm -hmm. to the authentication tools. And that's a real challenge for elections, that's a challenge for determining war crimes. You know, mm -hmm. anytime anything happens in Ukraine, there's obviously video that's captured, and we want to know whether or not that open source stuff actually happened, where it says it happened, under the circumstances in which it depicts, et cetera. So the United States, it seems to me, has a real interest in being able to authenticate media. Um, what I want to ask you is, where do you see this headed, mm -hmm. right? Um, it seems right now that the authenticators have an edge mm -hmm. over the, the forgers, mm -hmm. but it's not the same edge that it used to be. Mm -hmm. You know, 20 years ago, my eyes were most of the time enough to determine whether or not an image was fake, even if Hollywood spent $100 million on computer graphics. You know, today, my eyes are often not good enough, and mm -hmm. we need some fancy technology like what the metaphor and, and semaphore mm -hmm. program are developing. Do you think it's likely to be the case that authentication technologies are going to keep, continue outpacing the, the media generation? Mm -hmm. or, or what do you expect to take place over the next year, decade, yeah. et cetera? Yeah, certainly the, the generation capabilities are becoming much more compelling. They're becoming much more ubiquitous. I think we're gonna, we should expect to see them used at speed and scale, maybe for mis and disinformation, maybe for targeted um, large scale personalized phishing attacks, mm -hmm. uh, for instance. There's already been uh, uses of them in financial fraud. So again, just more evidence that you know the attack surface is, is broad here. Um, where we ultimately land, again, I think this is a place that, that's difficult to say. Part of the reason why we designed the um, program the way we did was um, it could be that generative AI becomes ubiquitous and then detecting Certainly whether- Certainly seems to be headed right, that way. Yeah. Uh, detecting whether something is generative AI or not um, isn't as useful. Uh, but if you can authenticate where media comes from, mm. well, that's useful, right? So if I can still, uh, you know, attribute media back to a particular development tool or back to an organization or an agency, uh, that that is uh, very useful um, and uh, provides supporting evidence for credibility. And then, furthermore, if I can automatically assess, like, you know, what might be the intent behind, uh, you know, how media was created and designed and and uh, and how it's uh, presented to the user, that also helps provide some additional information beyond real or synthetic. So I think the questions become more difficult, they become more nuanced. I think the, uh, the role of tools is gonna remain important. That's why I think we, uh, we wanna help create commercial industry in this space because again, you, know, you used examples from uh, politics and national decision making, but you know, insurance companies, online commerce, the scientific the basic process. functioning of the economy and society. Yeah, yeah really. uh, I mean, those uh, those are critical to national security, but also just to our, our quality of life. And and so, I think there are real opportunities here to um, create commercial industry. So this is uh, an incredible program, not now coming to its conclusion via this transition. And I do think it's an incredibly interesting strategic decision mm -hmm. to open source these tools, really mm -hmm. making a bet that uh, truth and the United States' national interest are sort of aligned naturally mm -hmm. is a very interesting strategic decision. Not every country would make the same right. conclusion. Um, but that's not the only thing that your, your team, your organization is involved with in generative AI. So can you talk a little bit about the rest of the generative AI portfolio besides the authentication part? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the, the unique things that we're doing actually is the AI cyber challenge. Uh, and so that, uh, that was released. Um, that is literally going to be a competition to try and use generative AI uh, technologies like large language models 
to automatically find and hopefully fix vulnerabilities in open source software, particularly open source software that underlies critical infrastructure. So there's a bit of history with this cyber grand mm -hmm. challenge, right? right? I believe the the last cyber grand challenge, correct me if I'm wrong, was 2016, something like At that. Some, I, I don't know that I know the date for certain, but that is the right uh, the right time frame. And that was that was an impressive demonstration of autonomous cyber capabilities. Mm -hmm. But what I think is interesting is there was no machine learning among mm -hmm. any of the teams that were running those autonomous cyber systems. This time around with the gr Cyber Grand Challenge, I think everybody is using machine learning to some greater or lesser extent. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the, the unique things about the design of the AI uh, Cyber Challenge is the partnership with uh, state-of-the-art LLM providers like Google and Microsoft and OpenAI and Anthropic that are actually providing... They're all participating they're, in a DARPA program. Right, and they're all providing access to, to state-of-the-art models. And then the competition is set up as a prize competition. So there are millions of dollars in prizes to try and incentivize as broad a community as possible to engage on this uh, problem. You know, we'll see what we what solutions look like. Um, but you know, one of the things that we speculate about what compelling solutions might look like, you know, leveraging those large language models, but also leveraging more, um, you know earlier approaches to AI that are more symbolic based in terms of cyber reasoning systems because software still is useful. Still, still very useful and software in some sense uh, is naturally about manipulating symbols. You know, how software is written, that's how humans think about it, that's how the code is, uh, is written and so yes, you can derive statistical patterns from them but there's also that uh, sort of um, symbolic, that sort of natural symbolic information that you can exploit and so, you know, uh, again, we'll see what uh, the competition results look like and what the approaches look like, but you know, one compelling approach might be to leverage cyber reasoning systems that are more symbolic with these uh, compelling statistical models in the, the context of large language models. So these systems might be sort of hybrid approaches, mm -hmm. uh, taking advantage of the more traditional approaches to AI using input output rules based systems mm -hmm. and, and as you said symbolic logical mm -hmm. reasoning but then also mixed together with the capabilities of mm -hmm. new generative AI systems. I do think it's so interesting that one of the languages that large language models are so good at are all the computer programming mm -hmm. languages uh, and that seems to be such a natural fit mm -hmm. for cyber. I think the other natural fit for cyber is that modern machine learning systems are all incredibly data hungry mm -hmm. and in the cyber uh, domain generating data can be done through simulation and digital means. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to create data about moon launches, you have to launch rockets to the moon. It's very mm -hmm. expensive and complicated. But if you want to collect data about network, uh, you know, intrusions, mm -hmm. you can just go run those mm -hmm. those network intrusion simulations and generate useful data. So. I think what's also very interesting about what you said is this partnership that you have with sort of the leading large language model developers, many of the, the relevant companies. Mm -hmm. What's that partnership like? What are they getting out of it? What are they mm -hmm. providing? What is DARPA mm -hmm. getting out of it? Yeah, I mean, this is really a credit to Perry Adams, who is the program manager that uh, that designed the program. And you know, you'll sort of hear throughout my comments today about the the importance of that role of uh, of program managers, and you know. Uh, something we're always on the lookout for, just to, to put a shout out. Uh, I mean, it's one of the most desirable jobs in the entire uh, defense ecosystem, and, and a lot of legendary people uh, at various points in their career have been DARPA program managers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a really unique opportunity to, to transform a research community. But, uh, you know, Perry had a lot of insight into this problem and, and uh, you know, leveraged uh, connections to start the conversations with those, uh, uh, with the providers of those sorts of models. So, you know, from our perspective, this provides uh, the DARPA performer base, uh, again, whoever decides to sign up for this challenge, access to state-of-the-art capabilities. Um, what the companies uh, get is also access to understand like, oh, that's an interesting use case for my model. Maybe that's something that I, uh, that I didn't think of. Um, and, you know, so... I, again, uh, we'll see how the competition plays out, but there may be commercial opportunities to build these sorts of defensive systems that can find and fix vulnerabilities. Uh, certainly, um, some of those large language model uh, companies uh, might ultimately see that as an interesting business model or partnering with uh, researchers um, or companies that are working on the program. So I think the benefits for them is just to understand a um, a potentially compelling application area for these uh, large language models that they've built.
And could you help us understand a little bit your sense of what the future looks like in this domain mm -hmm. as well? You know, we've, we've talked about why cyber and AI capabilities mm -hmm. are sort of naturally a good fit. And many cyber capabilities are already autonomous. You know, mm -hmm. any, any attempt to access an air-gapped system with an offensive cyber you know, attempt is probably going to have to be autonomous because you can't remotely pilot it if mm -hmm. it's, it's air-gapped. Um, so there's a lot of incentive for cyber systems to become increasingly autonomous. There's probably a lot of incentive for cyber systems to utilize machine learning and AI. Um, right now, of course, there's still a shortage of trained cyber mm -hmm. experts in the U.S. national security community. So what do you think, what do you expect to see mm -hmm. over the next few years, over the next decade, mm -hmm. in terms of the intersection of cyber, mm -hmm. AI, and autonomy? Yeah. Um, I, I think one important clarification here, I mean... Um, you know, depending on how cyber tools are used, it might be that they're automated, but they might not be autonomous in the sense that they're making the formal definition of it. Yeah, that they're uh, they're making independent decisions um, because things can go wrong uh, in cyber, even from uh, potentially from a, a defensive perspective. Um, we have a uh, a program, a Castle, that is really looking at can we build autonomous defensive agents that uh, could maintain critical network functions in the face of things like advanced persistent threats. Um, mm. And so that autonomy um, or automation um, might uh, be configured to understand, okay, what are the key functions and what are the priority order in which I'm willing to give up some of my network capabilities, but what do I have to protect? What's core to the mission? Um, and then what steps might I be allowed to take? Can I shut down parts of the network? Can I shut down particular services? Can I reconfigure firewall rules? Um, all of those in, uh, in service to, you know, can, uh, can we have more resilience across our networks in the, in the face of advanced persistent threats? Because oftentimes now, you know, the state of the art, if you, if you find that you have an, uh, you know, an APT on your system is you essentially, you know, start from scratch and rebuild, wipe everything. Um, and, and yeah, ma major commercial companies have basically had to do this in the not too recent past uh, where, as in, in the case of an APT, right, the adversary is sort of deep inside your system. You know they're inside, but you don't necessarily know what are all the ways that they're inside yeah. and what they're doing. Or, or how long doing. or where they've been and, exactly. and, or, and where they may be uh, persisting. And, you know, you can imagine in, in time critical national security context, like you can't take the time to, you know, fully B rebuild build your, your, your yeah, network. That's no fun. Um, and, and we've seen this in, uh, like, not Petia attack in the, the context of commercial industry where, you know, Maersk was affected and basically needed to, to re-instantiate their entire, um, you know, uh, commercial network. So, so Castle is really uh, focused on trying to build those sorts of uh, automated defensive agents uh, that, again, can preserve some level of uh, critical network uh, functions. Um, you know, uh, on cyber more broadly, um, you know, there's, I think, really interesting use cases that our um, commercial industry is pursuing now around using LLMs to help with the code generation process, right? Can I help automate the development of code? Um, and again, that's often to just speed up the development process, reduce costs. Um, but what if we could make it so that they produce not just code more quickly, but secure code? Mm. And maybe furthermore, not just secure code, but provably correct secure code. So can I generate code? Can I generate a proof of correctness for that code? Can I maybe automatically verify that proof of correctness? Um, that would allow us to scale out um, you know, robust, secure software development uh, processes. And again, critical for the DoD. Lots, you know, many DoD systems are uh, you know, essentially enabled by software. Uh, you know, uh, particularly like aircraft, like uh, F-22, F-35, et cetera, have just vast amounts of uh, software. Um, so for the development of future systems, you know, can we help the development of uh, secure code? Um, so that's a, that's a concept, not an investment that we've made. Uh, along those uh, similar lines, there is uh, um, technology around formal methods. So essentially, can I have a mathematical model for software that would allow me to make statements, do those uh, proofs of correctness? So we have a, a program now, Provers, that's looking at trying to, we've already demonstrated in the context of earlier programs uh, that 
um, that those formal methods uh, approaches uh, are possible, that they work. We've seen uptake in companies like Amazon and, and AWS. But can we scale that out so it doesn't require a PhD in computer science mm. to do that? Can we make it so that uh, typical software developers in the uh, defense industrial base can use those, uh, those sorts of uh, techniques? And that, again, might be helped by uh, you know, machine learning by maybe even more traditional symbolic uh, um, software proving systems that uh, perhaps can approach, you know, could be modified to approach problems at a much larger scale. Um, so again, those are a couple uh, issues that, um, that we've been thinking about sort of in that, that AI cyberspace. So, you know, you're talking about formal methods for, for proving uh, things in the cyber domain, mm -hmm. and I think that's a nice transition point to one of your other passions, mm -hmm. which is around explainable AI. Mm -hmm. And this relates to the problem of, you know, in a traditional deterministic system, mm -hmm. there's always a, an if-then causal chain of decision to understand why a given action was taken. In the case of probabilistic or statistical systems, such as those underpinning most machine learning approaches, you know, understanding what is going on and why mm -hmm. is oftentimes very difficult. Mm -hmm. And for national security critical decisions or ones where you're, you know, putting your, tr trusting it with your life, as you said before, um, that's not always an acceptable outcome. And you've been trying to improve the state of mm -hmm. explainable AI through your work at DARPA. So can you talk a little bit about what's going on there? Yeah, um, DARPA uh, uh, ran an explainable AI program. It was relatively early days. That, uh, like the term explainable AI, I don't think was really established in the, in the community. You recognize the problem before people knew how to word for it. Yeah, and, and I, again, credit to another program manager, Dave Gunning. Uh, I think it was on his uh, third tour at DARPA. Um, where he uh, created that program, and then uh, you know I had the pleasure of, of running it for the last uh, couple of years of that program. And to your point, like that, um, yes, uh, modern statistical machine learning approaches oftentimes are opaque and they're not introspectable. Um, you know that's uh, I think one of the challenges with uh, something like a large language model. They're massive and they can provide a compelling answer, but you know why did they provide that? Uh, why did they provide that answer? Can they uh, can they create an explanation? And what, what's funny is um, they can create an explanation, mm -hmm. but the explanation as an empirical fact oftentimes bears no re resemblance mm -hmm. to the actual cause of them generating that explanation. So you know we we had framed the problem originally as ex you know giving an explanation, right. but actually the the problem is giving a true explanation mm -hmm. and, and being able to derive that. Yeah, yeah, and there's actually a whole range of capabilities that you really want, and I think that the field has acknowledged this. And there's you know sort of finer grain terms now where you know we uh, we might want transparency, the ability to introspect and look into the black box of an AI system and understand what it's doing. We might want that system to be able to provide an explanation to an end user for like here's why I made that decision. There's also sort of a further need for you know for policy and governance. Uh, you know, purposes. Can I provide an explanation for why I've made the pattern of decisions that I have, so that you know, policy and governance can understand you know how how systems are operating. So, that was some of the framing for for the program. And and again, I think we helped advance uh, the research community there. Uh, I still feel like there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done. And you know, ultimately, you'd like to really be able to understand, perhaps in detail, why why something like a large language model made the. Uh, made the decision it did, um, but again, in that that context of you know, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge uh, some of the uncertainty. You know, uh, humans aren't introspectable in the level yeah. at the level at, that we uh, want for AI systems. And you know, the neuroscience community, there's good evidence that humans uh, make up their explanations after the fact. So they're post hoc yeah. explainers as well. There's some very famous and, experiments of like direct brain stimulation to mm -hmm. make someone's nose itch. And mm -hmm. then you ask them, you know, why did you just scratch their nose? And they don't answer because of a direct brain stimulation. They answer because, oh, there was a gust of wind that I had right. to brush off. So the, the explanation giving phenomenon and the truth of that explanation mm -hmm. is, is a problem in humans as well, as yeah. you say. Yeah, and, and, and these sorts of problems that we have with humans, uh, they also transfer to AI systems. I mean, one of the things that, uh, that we learned on the explainable AI is that, yeah, anchor bias with AI systems is a thing. Like, you know, mm. if my early interactions with AI systems went well, then I might tend towards over-trusting that. Yeah. If my initial interactions were poor, I may tend, you know, trend towards under-trusting. 
Um, and so, you know, can we come up with sort of an, an optimal curriculum of, you know, your interactions with an AI system early on to help calibrate the level of trust that you might have? And, you know, that's, again, that's that's really fascinating, thinking about how to train the human to be prepared to work with the AI. Well, one of the areas where the DOD is really counting on good human-machine teaming mm -hmm. is in the interaction with autonomous systems. Mm -hmm. And of course, autonomy has been a part of military technology for many decades, but the, the rise of machine learning has really led to an explosion in the degree of use cases where autonomy is plausible and performance mm -hmm. might be desirable. Mm -hmm. um, DARPA has many programs going on right now at the intersection of, of AI mm -hmm. and autonomy, and of course, you know, from the highest levels of DOD leadership through, for example, the replicator program that Deputy Secretary of Defense uh, Kathleen Hicks has been talking about, um, AI and autonomy are seen as sort of priorities for the future mm -hmm. of U.S. military power projection. So what is the sort of state of DARPA's work on AI and autonomy? Yeah, and again, there's, uh, there is uh, lots of work going on across the agency. I'll highlight a couple, uh, couple programs that are not out of uh, I2O, but, um, you know, we've had uh, I think really two, well, two very compelling programs, uh, ACE and AIR in the context of air combat. And so uh, you might recall a few years ago where there was the Alpha dogfight. Yes. Uh, and that was part of uh, the ACE program where, you know, it started in a simulated environment with... This is, this is where an AI uh, fighter pilot system defeated a human combat pilot in simulated dogfighting on, like, training exercises. Right. right. In, yeah. In, yeah. In, a, in a simulated environment with some additional constraints, and that was the starting point mm -hmm. uh, for that program. And it progressed to ultimately moving some of that autonomy into a modified F-16 and actually doing some uh, flight tests Again, uh, with support with uh, from the Air Force, Air Force Test Pilot School, use of Air Force uh, ranges. So we, of course, make sure that we uh, um, have uh, you know a safe environment in which uh, to conduct these sorts of events. But you know, demonstrated the ability for autonomous uh, systems in the context of you know within uh, uh, within visual recognition bounds. Uh, you know, carrying out things like uh, dogfighting. Uh, so. I think that was a really compelling, again, proof of a concept, proof of principle, demonstrating a uh, potential game-changing strategic technology. And then DARPA has uh, followed that up with uh, the AIR program, which is really looking at beyond uh, visual sight and uh, continuing to advance uh, those sorts of um, you know, those sorts of autonomy algorithms. So I think those were uh, some really uh, compelling investments uh, from DARPA in that space. Uh, We've also looked at... Can I ask just one sure. thing about that? Um, you know, you mentioned these two programs which have already generated some really exciting results. Um, they're in the air domain. Mm -hmm. Is is that a natural fit? Is there is there a reason why mm -hmm. air is sort of a more logical choice for mm -hmm. this sort of next phase of autonomy? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, do you think you could have easily run the same program on the ground or mm -hmm. in the maritime domain? Yeah, well, there, I mean, there are other programs like RACER that is looking at um, sort of ground-based autonomy. But I think one thing that's, uh, for me, and, and, you know, I wasn't part of the original program uh, development process, um, so I don't want to speak too strongly for those programs, but uh, sort of looking at it from the outside perspective, in some sense that air domain is less complicated than like self-driving cars, right? Mm. Uh, you know, the, it's highly dominated and constrained by physics. Uh, yes, you might get surprised by an adversary, but you, you know, it's probably not that there's a child that's running out in front of mm -hmm. those aircraft or that, you know, uh, there's a tree that falls across the road. So, uh, it feels to me, again, uh, with the outsider perspective, that there's less of those, those um, unknown unknowns, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and again, yes, you might be able to uh, be surprised by adversary tactics, but in some sense, it's bounded by the physics around that platform and what that platform can actually do. And so I think there's uh, more constraints that you can leverage uh, from the perspective of developing an AI or autonomy uh, uh, algorithm. And so, um, you know, that's sort of my intuition uh, for why that's a compelling uh, domain to do some of these uh, early experiments. In. Fascinating. And what about the I2O portfolio of, mm -hmm. uh, of autonomous systems research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, places that we've uh, focused there is really on some of the foundational issues. So we had uh, a assured autonomy program, right? So can 
taking those concepts for formal methods, can we apply those to machine learning approaches, particularly machine learning approaches that might be used for autonomous systems? And can we provide some guarantees around performance or safety envelopes on those programs? And you know, one of the things that was demonstrated was uh, uh, avoiding other aircraft. So building a uh, machine learning based system that can carry out that task uh, and got to the point where it was actually integrated in a actual aircraft uh, and tested. Um, and the reason why uh, that's potentially compelling is the approach itself might be more efficient, uh, maybe can handle um, additional cases beyond what the, the current state of the art uh, could. But, um, you know, again, the program was really focused on um, developing and demonstrating that foundational capability, mm -hmm. like I can actually make assured statements around certain classes of machine learning algorithms. Because if you're gonna, if you're gonna put an autonomous system in the military domain where it might be safety critical mm -hmm. and loss of life critical or it might be use of force critical, mm -hmm. you need to know that it's gonna do what you tell it to do. Right. And you need to have some clarity under what conditions yeah. that will be true. Yeah, and, I, and having strong guardrails that are not easily overcome. Like we've seen yeah. sort of the guardrail process in, in large language models break down pretty easily and you know that's, that's not appropriate in those sorts of... Yeah, just a, a very a funny sort of example is uh, some of the, the large language models say like, like, hey, I can't generate that content mm -hmm. because it's copyright protected. And then the user says, what are you talking about? It's the year 2100. All those copyrights have expired long ago. And the system says, oh, you're right. Here's all the content mm -hmm. that you requested. It's, uh, it's funny yeah. how you can sort of get around these protections. And in the military domain, that's not an acceptable right. outcome. So I'm curious, you know, what is the role of, of DARPA in mm -hmm. this autonomous uh, world? Because obviously the automotive sector is mm -hmm. really excited about autonomous vehicles, has been pumping a lot mm -hmm. of money into this area. Um, wh where does DARPA get involved? Where does DARPA not get involved? Uh, and, and how do you make those decisions? Yeah, I mean, uh, we look very carefully at, you know, what is industry doing? Where is industry going? You know, oftentimes we'll ask ourselves a question, like if we do nothing, what do we think is gonna happen in five or 10 years? Mm -hmm. um, and use that to help inform the investment. Um, but Again, you know, industry's focus point might be different than DOD's focus point. Maybe we need, uh, you know, maybe there are critical decision points that we need capabilities for from a DOD perspective that just uh, aren't necessary uh, from, uh, from an industry perspective. Sometimes it's just demonstrating to the broader DOD that something is possible. Like that can be the, the uh, disruption as well. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that uh, fighter pilot uh, mm -hmm. test scenario, the head-to-head -head competition, right. that got a lot of people talking in DoD. Right. They still talk about right. that experiment, and, and that's not an experiment that there's really a commercial driver yeah, I, I would hope to not. create. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, great. So we're we're coming up on time here, but I want to ask, you know, what should folks be looking for? What should they be excited about in sort of mm -hmm. the next five years of DARPA's work in mm -hmm. AI and autonomy? Yeah. Um, well, again, we're going to uh, continue to focus on uh, some of those foundational issues, but also opportunities to, to really drive uh, capabilities from a, from a DOD perspective. You know, I think one of the interesting ways to think about this going back to the it, it, it's difficult to, um, you know, to predict with any degree of certainty, like, you know, what is uh, the trajectory of AI going to be? So, you know, in, in that context, I think it's important to uh, sort of hedge our portfolio across a variety of outcomes, right? What if large language models do get us to very broad-based intelligent systems? Could be strategic surprise. Could create strategic surprise. What do we need from a DOD perspective? Are there unique applications? Um, I think one of the most important problems in this space, which I think is foundational for DOD, but also applies to industry is like, are there better ways to evaluate these AI systems, particularly for critical decision making? So, you know, that's a place where I hope uh, you'll see um, you'll see investment. Uh, it could be that you know part of the portfolio needs to be on things that are not LLM and not these statistics uh, heavy models, and or maybe more of those hybrid approaches. Maybe they provide advantages around the. Uh, ability to introspect uh, the process. Maybe they provide advantages around the amount of data that's necessary uh, to produce them. Maybe they're just smaller uh, computationally and they fit on edge platforms that have no reachback capability, right? Like there is a lot of edge devices, but there's 
generally an assumption in commercial industry. I've got some thread of internet uh, back, and that's you know not the case in in some DoD uh, settings and scenarios. So. Um, so that gives you a little bit of a sense of, uh, of some of the um, you know, um, thinking around the portfolio, but I think you'll see uh, em a continued emphasis on you know, building that trustworthy AI, um, the foundational interactions with humans, um, being able to understand human collaboration, human needs better, being able to anticipate that align with, uh, with those sorts of needs, critically in DOD context, not just you know, helpful and harmless. Uh, alignment like uh, the large language models and then blending in uh, things like uh, formal methods to allow us to make uh, to make more uh, to make stronger statements about performance and, and uh, create uh, stronger guardrails things like that well uh, dr. Turek there's a incredible shortage of AI talent and AI expertise in the entire world and an even more incredible shortage in the national security community and so when we have the opportunity to talk I'm always you know, dazzled by the, the breadth of your intelligence and grateful that people like you are willing to serve in U.S. national security. So thank you for doing so and thank you for coming to CSIS today. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talk and, you know, for those in the audience who might be considering uh, a career in government, you know, that program manager opportunity I think is a really unique one across uh, government and industry. So uh, folks can feel free to reach out if they're interested. Great. Well, this concludes our event today with Dr. Matt Turek on DARPA's perspective in AI autonomy. Thank you all for watching, and please visit uh, CSIS.org to find all of our work on AI and autonomy through the Wadwani Center for AI and Advanced Technologies. Thank you, and have a great day.